In this video, we're gonna try to get my computer to generate original images that look like screenshots from Battle for Dream Island. Hey new viewers, I oughta let you know that this video is a sequel to my last video. Now, it's not crucial that you go watch that video, but can't you feel those visceral emotions inside your body urging you to do so? Okay, so what is Battle for Dream Island? Sounds like a disease, doesn't it? No. It's an animated cartoon web series that my brother Fernozzle and I worked on for about four years. BFDI features 20... One, personified household objects, like pens and pencils, who are battling to win the grand prize of Dream Island. A while ago, I said BFDI was for children, but a few fans didn't like that. So I'll say it's for all humans who are children at heart better. Now, the point of this video is to teach you how generative adversarial networks work, but that's boring. Let's see how I got results. Step one was me thinking, well, Hypergan generated the cool faces last time. It would be interesting if you could generate something else, like maybe images of natural scenery. To do this, I'd need around 10,000 images to teach Hypergan every aspect of what it means for an image to contain natural scenery. I went to the r slash earth porn subreddit and tried using third party tools like Ripit and Reddit Rip to scrape all the images off of that site. However, Reddit seems to only allow external users to access 1000 links at a time or something. After just like 20 minutes of saving files, it stopped and it has only saved about 800 images. So you can see 823 files and the command prompt just said 909 posts processed and then it was done. Long story short, I couldn't get anywhere near that threshold 10,000. So I went for the next best thing, which is screenshots of BFDI. So this certain YouTuber, let's see, Walsh uh, M. Joey, to... has uploaded the entire first season of Battle for Dream Island as one video. You might think I'm angry at him for stealing our work or something, but I'm actually just glad that this resource exists. Because what I'm gonna do is download this video with KeepVid, and that'll give me a way to find a sequence of images that I can then train my Hypergan on. Okay, so we're gonna take this link, paste it here, I wonder how long it's going to take to download a three and a half hour video. The images are going to be small, so I don't need 1080p. I think 480p will be high enough. Save link as Battle for Dream Island full video. So this will take a while to download because it's so big. Two minutes. Oh, that's actually not bad. Okay, done downloading. It's only 500 megabytes. So what I'm going to do is drag this video into Sony Vegas. Now, if we were just to extract every single frame of the first season, we might have too many images, because after all, it's 3.5 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds times 24 frames per second, 302,000 images, and we don't need that many. So I'll just drag this in here or something. Wow, that's long. Okay, wow. Wow, this is the whole first season of BFDI. Now, like I said before, the GAN will train faster if the images are smaller in resolution, so in properties, instead of having it be 640 by 360, I'll have it be... Well, it's got to stay a 16 by 9 ratio, so how about 160 by 90? And then frame rate, I said I wanted about a 30th of the original frames, so at 24 frames per second, I'll just change that to 1. You can see, as I'm pressing the right arrow key now, it moves forward just one frame in the video file. But because my frame rate is set to 1, it goes forward a full second each time. So what you're seeing in the preview window over here is literally what the data set of images is going to look like. So the goal of the Hypergan is to pick up the style of and produce original images that imitate that style. Um, I have no idea how good or bad it's going to be, but I'm pretty curious. Okay, so it's 1.30 a.m. and I don't want to be up for much longer, so let's get to work. I'm gonna save this as see, BFDI full season, whatever. Now I'm going to render render as. Now usually when I render a video, I do it to MP4, but this time I want an image sequence and I've never done this before, but I think I can just go here and select PNG. Don't I need like extension of numbers like BFDI full season 000, whatever. I will change the folder though. BFDI images. We're going to save it in here. Let's just call it BFDI.png and see what happens. I think that's it. Now I'm going to render. Um... Okay, here we go. Oh wow, it's saving them so fast. It's already 2% done. Oh my god. 
I guess this is what my GPU is good for? Wow, it's just so fast. Like, you're watching all of BFDI just whiz by in front of your eyes. This is what it's like when you have a near-death experience. So what am I expecting out of this HyperGAN? I think it'll be able to learn to color the top half of the screen, that pale sky blue color, and the bottom half, that really bright grassy green, because it just shows up so much. There's a little bit of variance, right? Like there were even shots of real life when we did the puppet scene, and I think that will mess with the training data. Just like how Tim Tom's non-photograph image may have affected the training of the face images. But again, if it's a small percentage of the data, it won't have a big effect. Okay, here we go, just three, two percent left now, and... We're done! Oh, not quite. Now we're done. Okay, yeah. So we have BFDI 0, BFDI 1, so on, all the way up to 13,000. These are each 160 by 90 pixel images of every second through the season. You can actually click on these arrows down here to traverse one second forward and backward in the season, so this is like a low-tech viewing port of all of BFDI. So like, if you're low on money... Oh wait, this is going forward hundreds of images at a time. I'm not sure why. Anyway, like, yeah, this this would be like your low-tech, um, poor person's way of watching BFDI. Not really, though. So now what I'm going to do is run HyperGAN on that folder of images, but the problem is I only can get HyperGAN working on Ubuntu, so I'll have to switch over to Ubuntu. <sighs> okay, there we go. Um, we're running HyperGAN on the folder we're currently in, which is BFDI images, and... The images are 160 by 90, and there's three color channels on each pixel. Blah, blah, blah. 30, batch size is 32. We're going to make a sample image every 500 iterations, and there's where it's going to save the configuration. Let's go. <gasps> okay, gotta fix that. Okay, here's the generative adversarial network improving now over time. I was going to explain how that works in this video, but clearly this video is getting too long, so that'll be split into part three, I guess. I forgot to say, all credit should go to the creators of HyperGAN 255-bits, which are Martin and Michael, so yay. It didn't turn out as well as I thought it would, but that's fine because not every project has to be successful. Also, I feel like GANs are better with organic-looking objects. Um, something as sterile and flat as BFDI is going to cause problems because large swaths of the image are exactly the same color and that's not very organic. Oh, intermission time. I need to apologize for something. So the video you see on the left is something that showed up in my last video, but it was rendered incorrectly at certain parts. So I'm showing you the fixed version on the right side. And the difference is if a white pixel is actually part of a donut, I gave it a different value. So instead of one, I gave it a two. And the filter pixels that say a pixel must be black still register as yes when they're on top of a white donuty pixel, which is incorrect, so it's fixed here. Now it's time for announcements slash complaints slash whatever I want to talk about. Um, so first of all, I notice whenever I upload a machine learning video, it does really well. So thanks to everyone for watching, commenting, subscribing, giving me feedback and all that. Um, 
because yeah, it's it's really a thrill to watch all the feedback come in. Um, I see a lot of people saying things like, "Oh, you should have a PayPal or a Patreon so I could donate to you." So somehow Carrie has learned how to speak without moving his lips and is now speaking in third person. But anyway, what I wanted to say is, I am quite honored that you think my videos are worthy of your financial support. So if you do choose to support me, thank you so, so much. Ah! Okay, it turns out I do have a Patreon page, but I just haven't really advertised it because I kind of felt like some of my videos weren't worthy of asking money for. But you know, if people are asking me for the Patreon, I might as well mention it. So it's in the link in the description, patreon.com slash You can donate as little or as much as you want, blah, blah, blah. You know, it'll still be free for everyone. Everything you've heard from every other YouTuber. I also want to point out that just for the last two videos alone, I've written 10 processing programs to create the visuals. So that's the level of devotion I put in for you guys. One of the reasons why I felt bad about asking for money for these videos is that, unlike a lot of other YouTubers, my videos don't require expensive equipment or hiring a crew or props or materials. It's just me programming. So like, all it takes for me to make a video is time. But I'm realizing that it could actually come in handy in a few ways. One obvious one is that I'm still recording on my iPhone and the quality I think is fine, like I could upgrade to a better camera if I wanted to, but the problem is my parents and I decided that 16 gigabytes was all the space I needed for a phone, since it's just a phone. Um, at this point though, my apps and other stuff have taken up about 14 gigabytes, and I should like look through them and like delete stuff that I don't need, but it means that when I'm in a hurry, I only have 2 gigabytes of space to really film a video, that's about 10 minutes I think. So when I'm filming, once I hit the 10 minute mark, it fills up entirely, and what I do is I plug it into my computer, copy the video over to my computer's hard drive, delete it from my phone, and start recording again. And that's really inconvenient. I mean, some phones go up to 256 gigabytes now, which would mean I'd never have that problem again. So maybe money would go into that. But the second point I wanted to make is related to an announcement that I should have told you a while ago. I don't know how important it is, it's kind of personal. The college I'm going to is in the quarter system. So there's summer quarter, fall quarter, winter quarter, and spring quarter. And this was my fault, but I just waited too long to sign up for classes spring quarter. So I ended up in a bunch of classes that I didn't like, wasn't prepared for, and was only taking so I could get up to the minimum unit requirement. So I was just frazzled, and I was like, hold on, YouTube looks like a viable career for me right now. So I decided to take a leave and come back home and work on YouTube. And that's what I've been doing for the past two or three weeks. By the way, I'll be back in college in the fall, so nothing's permanent. But while my parents are pretty supportive of my decision and they let me do what I want to do, I don't think they're fully on board because they keep reiterating that you can never predict the future, YouTube could collapse, and no longer become a viable career option. And at that point, I'd be screwed. So what I should be doing is just finishing up that degree, which would only take another two years, and then I'd have a foundation that I could rely on. So there's no real issue here. It's just, I kind of want to validate my choices here to both myself and my parents and everyone. If I had a Patreon and there were like around a thousand people willing to support me, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable in saying, yeah, I decided to spend the next five months working on YouTube as a career because I have a following that can support me instead of just saying, oh, we'll see what happens. If you want to help me, I don't know, like think that what I'm doing is worth my time, then you can support me. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, we'll have to edit, edit everything out. I'm not very good at segues, but there's a big topic I wanted to mention. And it's just that like, I've been feeling very demotivated as I'm animating these videos. 99% of the videos on YouTube are just like this, where there's someone talking in front of the camera and all you really see is their face. And I thought I was kind of unique because I was, you know, drawing the stick figures and lip syncing the mouths. And I do think it's more enjoyable to watch that than this right now. But I was doing the <gasps> But I was doing some calculations and I realized that when there's about a minute of video that I want to animate, it takes about 500 minutes altogether of work on my part to go from the idea in my head to that minute of video 
on YouTube. There's the scripting, there's the audio recording, but 90% of the work is the animating. Yeah, animating takes a crap ton of work and you probably already know that. I've gone through quite some lengths to make the process more streamlined. For example, I've programmed commands into Flash to make lip syncing as like fast as like pressing buttons like this. And on a good day, I can get through one minute of animation in two hours, maybe three hours. But like, I just look at all the other YouTubers who just talk to the camera and like do their skits or their um, vlogs or whatever, and I just get jealous. I know it's a bad feeling to have, but I just get jealous that they can just churn out these videos. Right now I'm feeling a thrill that I'm just talking to you and I don't have to put in any further work and it's gonna be up. So I don't know why I'm saying that because I think my videos will still be animated. Maybe that's like another reason why there should be Patreon. Like I think it would be cool if I could have a team of animators. Oh, but that also brings me to one of my other machine learning ideas, which I've seen other people recommend too, where I take the audio, turn it into like a spectrogram and then apply convolutional neural, neural network on that spectrogram to figure out what mouth type should be showing at that time. And then you'll have a program that can lip sync automatically. And I know those already exist and I know that none of them do it that well, but I want to give it a try before I give up. I want to see if I can automate a process and make it take less work. Just emotionally, because I've taken a leave from college, I'm feeling kind of, like, I don't want to say depressed, because I feel like you need to, like, be clinically diagnosed to say it's true. But, you know, in college you have, like, all your friends around, you, like, go to classes and parties and events, and you're, like, around different people every single day. But at home, my parents, I don't, I don't think they enjoy how much time I'm spending on YouTube. And like, I just feel like the atmosphere is very negative. There's a bunch of... And I don't know. My, my days, I feel like they're pretty boring. Because like, I literally sleep in that bed there. And then I just come here and work on the computer. I'm like, is this all there is to life? Maybe I should have stayed in college. I mean, I know doing the problem sets and homework and finals and tests takes a sh crap ton of time but at least i'd feel like my days were different day to day and like it's my own fault i would find all of this video making and leaving a community at stanford behind worth it if my videos were coming out more regularly when they're coming out slower than once a week there's just not enough gratification for all that hard work and removal from society I'm putting myself through for me to say, yeah, the hard work is justified. I don't think right now it's justified. So maybe this is also the time that I should tell you I might upload more low quality videos, kind of like Care Relics in the past where I just revisit old projects that I've done and I just commentate on it and there's very little editing. There's probably more stuff that I've made that the internet hasn't seen than it has seen. I mean, also, when I'm at college, it's not taking up 100% of my time. I'm pretty good at doing the bare minimum to just scrape by in my classes. Well, scrape by as in still get A's and B's. But all of early 2016, I was working on TWOW really frequently while still taking like 17 units, which is a full load. So that just makes me doubt whether taking a leave was even worth it at all when I'm making videos so slowly now. It's just like, I got the worst of both worlds, it seems. I don't know why I'm telling you all of this, because I'm not a loner. I know a lot of people, but my house is kind of in the middle of suburbia, so nothing interesting is within walking distance. So you have to go really far before the excitement happens. Maybe there's one more thing I should ask you. Well, I'm probably gonna keep going on and on about this, but whenever I film unscripted stuff for videos, like, well, the second half of this video and all the Carelix videos, I cut out more than half of the footage. A lot of it's just silence or awkwardness, but a lot of it is me talking about unrelated things. Like maybe I'll talk about, oh, the file names are alphabetical right now or something nonsensical. And I cut those out because I realized that for most casual viewers, the longer it takes to get to the point of the video, the more they'll lose interest. So I felt bad in the last video, the Convolutional Neural Network one, how it took 10 minutes to get to the actually interesting time lapse. And I think maybe more people would have seen it if the time lapse happened only two minutes in, because then the casual viewer wouldn't have clicked away by then. So my question is, 
would you still stick around if I kept the boring mumbling in? Or should I cut those out? Because if I cut them out, there's technically less content, but the quality of the content goes up. I mean, my brother Fernozzle and I have plans for moving somewhere on a certain date, but it's all secret because we don't really want people to know <laughs> just yet, or maybe even ever, because that's like doxing yourself. The last month and a half has made me wonder how valuable freedom really is, because now I have all the freedom in the world in that I have no college classes telling me exactly what homework to do, and I have enough money that I don't need to worry about penny-pinching. still feel like a child, and like nothing's moving forward. I think it's partly because I'm living in the same room that I lived in when I was five years old, so I still have a lot of my toys like up there, which isn't a bad thing, but yeah, like I'm not progressing. And I don't know if it requires moving somewhere just for the sake of feeling like, it's a new place, I'd better be productive now. Um, or maybe it's about meeting new people, people who will bring me forward, people who do the same type of work that I do. I've also thought about how most jobs have a hierarchy of positions, like a ladder. But I'm in a strange position because when it comes to machine learning, there is a ladder, I'd say. And I'm like technically at the very bottom when it comes to like the traditional academics because I haven't taken any machine learning classes. If I were to like email one of these machine learning professors if they would turn me down or whatever, because at the same time when we look at the YouTube side of things, I've gotten pretty high, but YouTube and academics don't really mesh. And at the same time, I've been very frustrated with YouTube because, okay, well I haven't said this because I feel like this comes across as being jealous or mean-spirited, but I don't think anyone else on YouTube has really noticed me. And I'm not saying they have to. I'm not attention-seeking. I see so many YouTubers who are smaller than us who are already like collaborating and already being invited to VidCon panels. Jack and Jelfie has almost a quarter billion views. I'm not trying to brag and I'm not trying to say that I deserve anything because like I don't. And it's also my fault for not reaching out to those people to try to make things possible. I feel like the only thing that I can really say when it comes to YouTube success is to like show them the numbers. I can't really describe any cool things we've done. I can't really list off any cool people I know from YouTube. Um, well, I guess there's the meetups that we've done, which are kind of nice, but if it weren't for the numbers, like just the millions and millions of views, I feel like my YouTube career has not even begun. If this is all the stuff I'm gonna do for the rest of my life on YouTube, Again, it doesn't feel like I'm progressing. I guess that's the theme of this ramble, um, is stagnancy. The stuff I was doing when I was like 14, 15, they were like pretty cool for a 14 or 15 year old. The stuff I'm doing now is kind of the same level, but like now I'm 20, so now I should be doing cooler stuff. Well, I guess the topic of the videos has changed. Like before I was doing like solely kids animation, and now I'm doing, I guess like machine learning stuff, which is, might be too advanced for a 14 or 15 year old. But when it comes to the actual work I'm doing on the videos and like the people I'm working with, the workflow, I guess I'd say, nothing has changed since 2011 and uh, it doesn't feel good. Again, it's my fault. There's nothing you can do about it. I need to be more proactive in reaching out to people. It's very hard for me to do that. I think my personality type, like I'm one of the most introverted people I know. That's not to say I'm shy, because I think I have enough confidence to like speak to people, but I don't know, it's, it's just hard. You know, all this talking, I should make it into a video of its own, but I think if I made it a video of its own, then no one would end up watching it. You know, I look back to myself when I started BFDI when I was 12 or 13, and I just wonder how I had the work ethic to animate 10 minute videos every single month. Like, I think it was an average of three hours of work every single day. And I, did I never question, is this all worth it? Did I ever question, like, am I putting in too much time to something that's not, not gonna amount to anything? Well, it did amount to something, but I just, I, if I try to imagine myself going through the same type of project now, I think I would quit. One thing, that has made me question whether I am a YouTuber is Casey Neistat's do what you can't video. And he was talking about how if you can find a community of people online who like your stuff, 
like YouTube can take you to new levels and like things in your life will be happening to you so fast you can't even comprehend it all and it'll just be so exciting and it's like screw the 9 to 5 job, screw what all the traditional people say you can and can't do, do what you can't. And it was pretty inspiring and I've like heard messages like that many times before which is why I found it strange that that one really spoke to me. But I brought it up because it feels like life isn't going so fast that I can't comprehend. Like, it's actually going kinda slow. I was just thinking, I'm almost just waiting for fall quarter of college to start so I can get out of this house again. Get back into a bustling community of people around my age who are all doing exciting stuff. And like the next five months until that happens are just me waiting. So like, what am I gonna do for the next five months? Why is it that when it comes to the numbers, it seems like YouTube's been going great for me, but when it, when it comes to my actual lifestyle, I feel like I have the most boring life of all time. I try to avoid being inside the house all 24 hours, so I go on walks every day, but like, it's around the same neighborhood. It's around the same place where my elementary school is, and I see the same play structures I used to play on when I was five or six. Again, it feels like stagnancy. It feels like <laughs> I haven't grown up. Uh... Help me, I'm, I'm scared that my life is going to be like this for the next 60 years. I don't know if I'm ever gonna find a solution, maybe. I don't wanna blame it on my introversion, though. I feel like I'm trying to blame things. I think it's just, <sighs> eventually I have to come to terms with the fact that I have to improve myself and enough complaining, time for changing. So what are the changes I'm gonna make? My brother and I talked about moving out and I already mentioned that. But that's not enough, because I can imagine moving out somewhere and still living the same lifestyle. So I feel like even if I were to move into a place near a lot of animators, like, would that change it? I mean, would it? I could go up and talk to them and say, like, do you want to work on an animation together? And maybe we'd make one video together, one 30 second video. And then what? Then I have to ask again, like, what's going to come out of that? I'm too pessimistic as a person. I used to be super optimistic. Like, when it came to YouTube, I used to think it was, like, the best thing that humanity had ever created. And what I thought of it as was a slot machine, like gambling, where you could never lose. Because if you upload a bad video, it doesn't get any views, but it doesn't hurt your channel. But if you upload a good one, you get a lot of subscribers. So it's really just, yeah, a gambling game where you can never lose. And that just felt like the most exciting thrill to me ever. And I guess that's what propelled me through working on BFGI for so many years. But that that optimism has turned very quickly into pessimism. I think around the end of high school when I was like taking four AP classes and I was miserable, that's what flipped it for me. Someday I'd like to work on a big project with a handful of other people and we'd all work toward a common interest and that way I'd feel like I, I have my, my squad. No, that's a cringy word. The more I think about it, the more a 9 to 5 job doesn't feel so bad because it forces you to get to know people, but it doesn't though. Again, I gotta be proactive. Maybe I should initiate these projects instead of waiting for them to fall into my lap. But again, that's hard to do when you live in the middle of a suburb where everybody is either an elementary school student or a parent of an elementary school student. I don't know what the goal of all that talking was because my life is my own responsibility, and I can't expect anyone, especially people who only know me online, to do anything for me, so just forget I said all that. And I think back to my own experiences, where I have had a lot of deep conversations with other people about um, like what I will have to change about myself to be happy, and I feel like they're so momentous at the time, like I've had a big epiphany, but one day later, I'm exactly the same because I, th I think personality is more connected to how your brain is wired inside your head chemically than all those conversations, which is why some people are naturally good at some things and naturally bad at other things. So maybe this is just the way I have been programmed. So that's me. Maybe the whole point of all that talking was to say, hey, support me on Patreon. So this video making process is a little easier for me and I can buy a new iPhone or camera or GPU or whatever. And hey, follow me on Twitter because for some reason my YouTube to Twitter ratio is 100 to 1, whereas with most YouTubers it's like 5 to 1 or 4 to 1. So 
clearly I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I need to advertise it more, but I feel like crap when I advertise because like how narcissistic could you be? So don't follow me. I don't know. Follow me, but my tweets aren't very high quality. Uh, I don't know. This video is going to end up being half an hour, isn't it? And people are going to be expecting half an hour of machine learning goodness, and they're not going to get it. Well, I think if I talk for any longer, I'll just start talking in circles, so I'd better wrap it up now. What's my next video going to be about? I have no idea, but I have been thinking about this gravity simulation visualizer heat map kind of thing that has actually been on my mind since 2011, so that's how long I've had it sitting there. So maybe I'll do that. I also want to show off my lip syncing programs that make me lip sync like three times faster than I used to. Or maybe it'll be that programming a neural network completely from scratch, assuming you know nothing, tutorial that I keep talking about, because I think that one would be the most helpful and actually educational to people. Um, so yeah, a lot of things I have planned, but I think when it comes to starting any individual video, just in the short term, I'm very pessimistic, can't find motivation. In the long term, I'm super excited. I feel like the future can hold anything. It's just something I'm going to have to overcome myself. Um, but with that being said, I think it's time to say goodbye. So, goodbye. Are you going to upload that? Are you really going to upload that? Yeah, I'm going to upload that. Oh, I'm going to upload it. Okay. <sighs> You're not supposed to open up that much for the internet.